where we're supposed to put everything in containers now. So, yeah. um, I think we just start a little bit waiting for the mic. Uh, it's it's probably it's probably fine. Yeah, that's you're gonna we're gonna start we're gonna start anyway. So it's 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 good. Yeah. So uh, thanks everyone. Well, uh, welcome and thanks for having us today. Today's presentation is about like containerizing everything, containerizing infrastructure, containerizing storage, and um, yeah, Sean. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Cohen. I'm a, a product manager for OpenStack. Um, this summit was almost like a, a container summit as well for OpenStack, right, in terms of number of tracks. Uh, but one of the themes that uh, I've been missing is like, great, we, have, we, can, we can use uh, OpenStack on containers, we can use containers on top of OpenStack, but one thing we forgot in the middle is what about storage, right? Uh, Ceph is by far the number one storage uh, 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 adopted in OpenStack, and, and we basically, as we move forward with enabling containers on top of OpenStack, or actually using containers on top of OpenStack, we need to make sure that everything else goes along, right? And what else is more important than having our, our stuff uh, to go with it? So that's what's pretty much the theme of today. And I want to uh, present as well my colleague. Hello, I'm Federico Lucifredi. I work on a Ceph in the Red Hat storage business. All right, so well, I'm Sebastian, uh, mainly working on Ceph, a really Ceph-centric person. So working on several topics around Ceph, like Ceph and containers, Ceph and OpenStack, Ceph and configuration management systems like Ansible. So always rotating between um, like the ecosystem around Ceph. So OK, let's get into it. Um, a little bit of background before we start. Uh, realm of containers, uh, why containers? Why are we doing this? So these are the, the major drives that we, that we have at the moment. Uh, why are we all moving toward containers? Why do we all want to containerize everything, every single piece of our infrastructure? Uh, so mainly because uh, containers are bringing really nice and nifty features uh, such as packaging format and runtime. So for example, uh, you're bringing your own application and all of its dependency as part of a container image and then you can run it everywhere uh, without having any like dependency on the host or, or anything else. Um, which means that we can also provide uh, upgrade capabilities and downgrade capabilities as well. So we can easily bootstrap new versions of your own application, so next to the first one, so you can just start a new container with a new version and just down downgrade the version if something goes wrong. Uh, the flexibility of the deployment, uh, this is fairly easy to run a container, this is fairly easy to tear it down. Uh, scalable, of course, uh, we, everyone wants to scale. Uh, we all want to put as much resources and take the best advantage of, of uh, all of our, all of the hardware, so it's, um, something really good as well. Uh, and one of the really nice capabilities of containers is that they have the ability to restrain all the resources. So what you're dedicating to a specific process uh, is only for that process and you can avoid like any effects such as uh, noisy neighbors and things like this. So what we're looking at at the moment is that we know that we're gonna go for containers and then we, the, the next question is like uh, how to use them efficiently. What tool can we use? What's the tooling around? What's the ecosystem available around containers to get, just take the best out of them? And then this is why entering Kubernetes with OpenStack. Um, so this is just um, a set of features that are really connected with what we want in OpenStack. So of course, Kubernetes has many features, many advantages, but these are the ones that we are really focusing in when we use OpenStack. So we want things like self-healing. Uh, if something goes wrong, uh, one on the node goes down, we want to quickly be able to recover from this. So we really want to have this self-healing capability from Kubernetes. Uh, load balancing functionalities, when you use OpenStack, we have multiple APIs and then we have multiple entry points, which means that we need a way to load balance all of the APIs. So this is what we need and we have that out of the box with Kubernetes. Automated rollout and rollback, so we can perform upgrades sequentially from every node, services by services and node by node. Something that is also really nice because everything is fully automated. And then what's really Vital for us is this uh, really pluggable nature of Kubernetes where everything is pluggable. Um, nothing is really monolithic. Uh, there is a core, of course, that brings all the nice features and all the nice functionalities like load balancing and stuff, but they don't really want to reinvent the loop or to just get everything into a single core. So that's why they have this really nice pluggable infrastructure with storage first. Um, you can easily develop your, your own driver for Kubernetes. It will be integrated into the core, so they just don't want to repeat everything. They have the same for network with CNI, container network uh, interfaces. Uh, they also have, um, they also support multiple container engines. Um, well, it's still kind of a blueprint for now, but started with Docker and they want to go with RunC and, and others. 
And of course, we have the scheduling. There is a native scheduling function, but we, we can potentially plug other schedulers as well, such as Mesos, uh, Swarm, but we just, um, for now, we just stick with the basis uh, and stick with, with, with what's the default. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Sean that will be explaining uh, why are we, uh, how are we gonna just put all the things together and how are we gonna, going to containerize all the OpenStack services. Thank you, Sebastian. So if you think about it, um, OpenStack and containers, right, there's a lot of similarities. Um, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, uh, and, um, we have pretty much, whoa, this is like it has its own life. All right. <laughs> um, all right, let's do this. No, it's just, um, just. Oh, yeah, it's, all right, perfect. Yeah, sorry. All right, I got it. All right, Too much so um, we have a lot of similarities, right? Uh, Kubernetes deals with microservices. And if we look at OpenStack, the way OpenStack services were born, right? Look at the core services like Nova, Neutron, Cinder. They were actually were treated as microservices uh, uh, on their own, right? Uh, yes, we have like RabbitIQ and other layers that are not microservice in OpenStack, but the core services uh, have the same approach of deployment. And if you look at Kub what Kubernetes does to applications the, 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 in a containers, right? We're pretty much doing the same thing. So it's, it, as you saw, it has the scheduler, it has the pluggable interfaces, very similar to OpenStack mindset. So when we put these two together, there's a lot of similarities lines, and, and it's more than that. We can actually turn OpenStack itself into a microservice-oriented architecture uh, uh, with, our, with our services. And, and basically, we let Kubernetes, what it does best, which is managing the applications, but then, when it comes to, uh, uh, if you look at the Kubernetes loads, right? Uh, uh, Sebastian touched like scale up, scale down. Uh, the, the, the changes that uh, container lifecycle goes through, sometimes in, in a matters of uh, minutes, sometimes in hours and days, it actually needs a scalable infrastructure to, to grow, right? And, and in a sense, in that regards, uh, this is where somehow Kubernetes is limited uh, because it, think about storage, right? All the plugins you need to write uh, uh, directly into Kubernetes today. But if you look at OpenStack services, we have already solved that problem. How many drivers we have just on Cinder? 70. 70. Uh, Manila, about 30, right? Not to mention Neutron. <laughs> so we have hundreds of hundreds of already integrated plugins into OpenStack. Uh, so when we look how we can basically, uh, uh, basically uh, take the power of cloud and charge it to Kubernetes, and this is what we aim to do. Um, so we basically leverage days of deployment we already have in, in OpenStack, and, and the scale and basically the power of containers altogether. That's the main benefits we get out of the box. Now, in terms of day two, uh, we basically would like to share the scheduling function, functions between Nova and containers, right? So it's not like, yeah, we're replacing Nova now with uh, Kubernetes scheduler. We actually leverage, leveraging both. Um, so how do we do the, this? What's the secret? How do, can we deploy OpenStack services uh, fast, right? Uh, and, and easy, as, as Sebastian indicated. So uh, we started, that's a quick history lesson. Uh, we at Reddit started already trying to dig this problem a couple of years ago, uh, back in 2014, uh, with uh, initiate of the COLA project. Um, basically, the work have started around uh, the Paris summit. And I'm very happy to stand here in Barcelona, right? And to declare that, first of all, we already have done a lot of the work already. So some of the stuff I'm gonna showcase right now is available. If you go now to Tucola OpenStack website, you have guides for everything I'm gonna showcase you can actually start doing today. So yes, Cola deals with, I'm, based, I'm, I'm not solving the containers, right? I, I'm, this will only solve. You can really run containers of tough open, OpenStack cleanly. What we're doing is like how we can use the power of containers for deploying OpenStack, right? And that's what it's all about. So Cola basically solved that problem. Uh, and enabling us to take a, most of the services uh, uh, we already have in a microservice uh, fashion in OpenStack and basically deliver it uh, and, and, and for our deployment. So we're taking the containers benefit for our OpenStack benefit, right? It, this is what's radical here. It's not just the ability to uh, serve the application workloads on top of our cloud infrastructure. We're actually doing the uh, upside down. We're, we're using the same technology to simplify our life uh, with the cloud infrastructure. So it, it solves both the manageability 
uh, of the container infrastructure on top of the, uh, on top or actually leveraging it for the cloud infrastructure, and we're basically optimizing uh, 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 to an image-based right approach management uh, where we leverage the current OpenStack projects. Right, we, we're leveraging the, the heat templates and YAML files to define the service uh, and pods. Right, so you can have a Cinder API pod, you can have a Keystone API pod. So we're basically translating all the services uh, to basically containers approach. Um, and, and what this transfers, and how many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you have to go through uh, uh, old-fashioned upgrade in OpenStack? Just raise your hand, all right. How long that, it that process took you? Too long, Too long. weeks, right? So, so we're talking about seconds. <laughs> this, is, this is like changing the rule of the game for us. Um, and some of the small uh, new services that help us do it uh, is a good example. So Courier is, an, is, is a project uh, uh, that basically just takes all of the network drivers from Neutron and enable them for the use in containers. Uh, similarly, we have Fuxi, which is another small uh, 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 project, but has very key. Uh, it basically allows us to take all of the 70 uh, plugins that uh, Federica mentioned and just connect them to our cloud. So instead, if I'm if if I'm a, a, a uh, now have all the choices in my, in my backends, right, in my data center. I was, want to basically use them for, for OpenStack, right? Instead of like, going and, and sit on my vendor, right, write a plugin for Kubernetes, I just have Cinder. I, I, it's, it's already integrated. It's there. I can just use it. That's what's radical here. We're basically really unleashing the power of OpenStack <laughs> with containers. Um, and with that, let's do a zoom in into what specifically we've done around Ceph. Uh, Federico? Yeah. Thank you. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo va el examen todavía? <laughs> Voy a volver uh, a continuar en inglés antes um, de crear un pánico con mi español rioplatense. <laughs> o oh, en los que no hablan inglés y no, no hablan español. Um, or up on the oh, yeah. Wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, whoa. <laughs> yeah. All right. So is I'm not touching it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God we have keyboards. Yeah, really. All right. So uh, call a coverage for containers. Um, call a coverage for storage. <laughs> We cannot manage a presentation. Color coverage for storage. Um, all the services are covered. Um, there are a number of options around Ceph. You can do the obvious minimum deployment requiring uh, three nodes. There is a developer-friendly deployment that goes for a single node. Obviously, it has no resilience, and it's not something you could support, but it can be convenient in, in development. And it also supports use of external clusters, so you could uh, configure a caller deployment against an external Ceph cluster if you wanted. Now, um, Cola itself has a funny reputation in terms of when you talk to the users, are you using Cola? The answer usually is no. But if they are using containers, you ask them, where does the code come from? The answer is Cola. So it's a project that is borrowed very heavily from. <laughs> Just this morning, a customer told me, I'm not using Cola, but I'm stealing liberally from it. It's, it's a place that apparently is very popular for borrowing code for creating your own container deployment. So it's, it's more popular than, than the straight answers would, uh, would make you think. Uh, there is one more thing that I would point out in terms of um, storage, and particularly Ceph integration with Cola, and it is that currently uh, Cola maintains its own uh, its own playbooks to do uh, Ceph instead of using upstream. So perhaps that's, that's an opportunity for better integration between uh, Kala and the Ceph community. So upstream for, for Ceph in containers is the Ceph Docker project, which has been surprisingly successful for an infrastructure project, um, 500,000 poles plus from Docker. Um, this is actually Sebastian's project, but since he is modest, I'll do the bragging for him. Uh, this has been um, extremely successful, and it's been out for almost two years, so it has seen quite a bit of action so far. Um, 
It supports most major OSs. It is what you get when you do Docker pull Ceph. That is uh, where the, um, the, the images are coming from. And we have, uh, this is also what you get when, if you are a Red Hat customer, we have a tech preview of a, support, uh, of a container using our supported bits that is also built this way. So this is really the root of all Ceph containers today. So how does it work? It is a single image, single Docker image that you can provision any Ceph daemon from. So uh, you Docker pull the single image, and then you Docker run with a number of environment parameters, saying I want an OSD, I want a mon, I want an MDS uh, or RGW. These are the usual Ceph daemons, so I'm not going to explain those, but there are a couple of more esoteric daemons up there that not all of you may know about. There is a gateway for uh, NFS to RGW that is, um, that is coming into Ceph, and that deployment of that in a container is also supported, as well as RBD mirror, which is the disaster recovery asynchronous replication between Ceph clusters that was introduced with Ceph 2.0. There is also an iSCSI daemon that is coming. This is not supported by the image yet, but it will be short. So, Besides choosing what type of daemon, you also pass configuration, saying where the monitors are, for example. And you can uh, choose between many different options for building your OSD, where uh, you can co-locate the journals, you can have dedicated journals, you can you configure the encrypt um, to encrypt the underlying storage that the OSD is using. You can deploy BlueStore for testing purposes, or if you're building the system uh, in another way, you can just uh, point to a directory and assume that the setup has been done independently. Currently, the primary deployment method is Ansible. Um, and in the Ansible configuration, conveniently, uh, the, running, the running daemons are managed by systemd. So systemd does the watchdog activity to see if, um, if the daemon crashes to do the respawning and so on and there is experimental support for Kubernetes. So this is at a glance where we are in terms of what is available today for containerized Ceph. Now we've seen OpenStack and we've seen Ceph, and let me have Sebastian put it all together. Okay, <clears throat> going back, all right. So, uh, so now that we know all the, we know that we can containerize OpenStack, we know that, that we can containerize Ceph, uh, it's time to like put, put, put all the things together and to see how we can deploy uh, all of them. So we actually have three, I kind of identified three methods, methods to. Okay, I'm back, all right. Um, so the first one, the one that you might be familiar with already because it's an OpenStack project, is Triple O. So at its core, Triple O is using uh, Heat to orchestrate the deployment. And Heat has a really a nifty mechanism, like a hook mechanism, by default, it's, it's using Puppet, but then you have hooks for Ansible, and you also have hooks for uh, Docker, basically. So one, options that, one, one of the options that you could do is just to use triple O and de deploy your containerized infrastructure by relying on this Docker hook. So just reusing the exact same tool that you're using to deploy your non-containerized environment. Then we have Ansible, and we, we all love Ansible. Uh, I really like Ansible. And uh, for us, it's really the kind of a de facto standard because it's easy to learn. Uh, the, the, it's so user friendly, uh, tons of interface, it's Python friendly. Uh, it, well, basically, everyone loves it. The, the only thing is, if you want to use Ansible, then it's kind of a, a flat deployment because then you, just, you describe all your hosts. You say, okay, this host is going to run a monitor, this one's going to run an OSD, a RADIS Gateway, an MDS. And then you just deploy it. So once, you, once it's deployed, it's just up and running, but there is no lifecycle management out of it. If something goes wrong, if something breaks, uh, then only systemd can help you because we are uh, treating containers as services. So we use unit files from systemd to run containers so we can treat them as services. But despite of doing the watchdog process, as Federico mentioned already, um, we, there is nothing more that we can do. So. Uh, Basically, it's uh, really flat. It's uh, not dynamic, and uh, but it's easy. So if you're not ready yet for Kubernetes, but you want to get your hands on containers to see how they work, how they they interact with each other, when something goes wrong, how you debug it, and, and things like this. So it's a, it's a really good way to start. 
ultimately what we want to do, what we want to achieve is because currently Kubernetes has some limitations that we're going to see in a minute. Um, ultimately, we want to use Ansible to deploy the infrastructure, so to deploy Kubernetes, and then we want to use Kubernetes to just deploy and maintain everything. So as, as I said, uh, Kubernetes is not fully compliant yet, so it doesn't really um, comply with all the requirements that we have when we are deploying OpenStack clouds. And the big question is, are you really, really ready for containers? And also, is, is Kubernetes also ready to support and to be as well integrated as we do uh, for uh, OpenStack clouds? So this is a, a gap analysis that, that we did, uh, we run internally, uh, and we just listed all of the options that we want to see by default when we are deploying OpenStack Cloud. The, per the first one and probably the most important one is to have network isolation. In OpenStack, when we currently deploy it, we have networks for APIs, for internal tenant communications, for storage, for storage replication. You can add as many interfaces as you want to bring this isolation. And uh, the default um, networking model from Kubernetes relying on Flannel doesn't really allow you uh, to have this uh, really complex network isolation. So, because by default it's just, just a single namespace and you can't really have dedicated interface. And what we really want to achieve here is to have multiple interfaces within the container so we can say, okay, this interface is going to be for APIs, this one for accessing the storage, this one is for storage replication. Um, we will, see, we will see further in, in the presentation that this, we, we have options to do this and we're currently working on that, but to me it's currently one of the best, the main pain points. Um, then moving on to having the ability to disable this overlay network by simply using host networking, which basically means that we are not running any network namespaces within container, but we are exposing the network functionalities from the host um, to the containers. So when you run your own containers and you use, the, you use host networking, then all of the daemons will be listening on the IPs on the host on the physical machine. So this is actually something that we can do and this is one of the workarounds that we are gonna use from the beginning because we don't have this really proper network isolation and segmentation. Then we wanna be able to use IPv6. This is uh, currently OpenStack services have the ability to listen on IPv6, and then we really want to have this. Um, it, be, it has become really popular now. Currently, in, within Kubernetes, it's, it's really, the, the current implementation is really rough, and so it's more considered as a work in progress. It, I think it just came out with the 1.3 release, but it's, it's not really robust and complete yet. Since we are doing log balancing, and we have public API endpoints, we want, really want to have the um, the possibility to do SSL termination. This is something that we can do with the, the balancing service um, and all the ingress um, uh, routing basically from Kubernetes. So we can do this and, and it's nice. We need to have data persistency. So bringing persistent storage to containers. As explained earlier, we really have, um, Kubernetes is really pluggable and we have several interfaces. So we can plug, at, at, at its core we can really plug um, storage technologies like Ceph, like iSCSI, and we, really, we already have drivers for this, but we can also rely on, on Fuxi to connect Kubernetes to the Cinder OpenStack environment so we can just consume all of the drivers that are available. The idea here being of you have, a, you have an OpenStack service that is up and running, and then you want to save and store its configuration, so its config file, so if something goes wrong, you just want to move this container to another host and it can we can easily reconnect the storage. So in the case, for example, of something like Galera or RabbitMQ, we can just rebootstrap. Well, we like to use Ceph, so what we're going to do here is just map a block device, and then, so we move, if, some, if something crashes, you just restart the container somewhere else, you just link the new, you, you link the storage and you attach it, and then you're up and running again. We want to have some uh, nice ordinancement when we do um, cluster bootstrapping, because we know we're not going to deploy Nova Compute before uh, the database, so we really want to start with Ceph, database, RabbitMQ, then Keystone, and all, the, all of the other components. So we really want to have this nice uh, ordinancement capability, and then we have it within Kubernetes. Uh, not replication, of course, because we want to have a specific set. We want, let's say we're going to do um, controller's replication from Kubernetes, so we just say I want this uh, pod, the API pod, to be replicated three times across these kind of hosts uh, that are being labeled as controllers, for example, and Kubernetes will do that for us. 
Pod, pods monitoring is a function that, that is currently built in into Kubernetes, but it has, um, it has its own limitations. So we don't, it doesn't really support native TCP, for example. It's purely HTTP. Uh, there are projects for that. So in the case we want to do this at the TCP level, then we might have to build another container, like a, a, a pod that is monitoring. Um, there are always, always ways to, um, to work around that. So this is one of the things we can do. Load balancing, it's really out of the box, something that we already discussed. Uh, pod fencing is really critical for us because we, I mean, Kubernetes can be, let's say, uh, not smart enough to understand that even if I asked for a replica 3 for my replication controller, it, so Kubernetes would, will try and do its best to give me the desired state, the state I asked for. So if if this keeps failing, uh, Kubernetes will keep on trying to do it. But yeah, we, do, we don't really want to do this forever. So ideally, we would like to have this kind of fencing mechanism. If we, after let's say five attempts, then we just want to kill and fence the node and so we can start investigating what's wrong. Yeah, there is, um, the, we just don't need to restart and try to restart it forever. It doesn't really make any sense. So, Going back for a second about this networking program that we are having, uh, to me, once again, it's really vital that we have the ability to segment, isolate all the different networks uh, within OpenStack. So there are several ways to do this, and thanks again, um, because of the really pluggable nature of Kubernetes, we can have CNIs, so a container of network interfaces. And to me, it's probably the best way to solve this issue. With that, um, we can use different CNIs uh, if you, that we, that we can connect to a specific SDN, and then this will just be in charge of uh, providing the network, so we won't be using Flannel anymore, but you will be relying on the SDN that you're currently using. And then for this, we will have the possibility to have multiple interfaces within the container, and then finally achieve what we want to do, having several interfaces listening on several network, being exposed <coughs> and configured um, by, because they're, they point to a specific physical interface and we have this dedicated network, dedicated VLAN, uh, whatever you want to do. But it's a, it's a little bit of a, a chicken and a egg problem because when we bootstrap, let's say we, let's say Kubernetes is ready for a second and it's fully compliant with everything that we want to do uh, for, for deploying OpenStack clouds uh, within containers. We have a bit of a sequencing, sequencing problem because um, when you start deploying OpenStack, then Neutron is not up and running yet. So how should you configure Kubernetes to use the CNI and to bring all of the networks? So uh, one, of, one of the things to do is either you bootstrap and configure Neutron by yourself, and then you can connect to Kubernetes, but then it's a, you're using like two different methods to configure everything, so it's not really ideal. Um, one of the other options could be bootstrap some kind, kind of a fake and ephemeral Neutron, for example. Um, before deploying the OpenStack environment, so you can, so everything be, is being set up uh, on the machines. You have containers up and running that are providing the network, um, and everything is ready, so ready to be consumed once uh, you want to deploy OpenStack and and you want to leverage the the, the CNI functionality with Kubernetes. Uh, there are several plugins at the moment, and we still don't know yet which direction, which one we're going to use, but it's 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 likely the best way to uh, to solve that problem. So now that we, uh, we are all really amazed by this and you all want to go with containers, but uh, you're already running non-containerized environments, and you might be wondering, okay, um, how am I supposed to just migrate from a non-containerized platform to a containerized platform? And we have several solutions for this. All right. So these are like two potential, potential ways to address the migration. Um, Either you use Kubernetes, either you don't. Um, it's not really a problem because we, we all want to have a really smooth uh, transition path from non-containerized to containerized. So let's say for a minute that you, you don't want to use Kubernetes yet, but you want to keep on using Ansible or maybe Triple O or maybe any other configuration management system. Uh, so one, one of the things that you could do is simply start stopping services and then you just uh, start your own containers so they can join. So if we take the example of a cloud controller, you can just, because we have three, so we have a crew room and we, uh, if, if one goes down, then we're still up and running. So you can easily stop one service and then run the proper automation with that. So 
If you use Ansible, you can say, okay, Ansible, stop the service, and then generate the systemd unit file where you have your container being uh, declared, declared, and then run this unit file. So stop the service, uh, disable the service from systemd, and then simply run your container, bind mount all the proper directories, do the proper connections, and just start your service. So um, eventually, it will just go back in Quorum and within uh, all the, con well, the rest of the controllers. So that's, that's one idea. Uh, if you're ready for Kubernetes, and well, hopefully uh, Kubernetes is ready for all of us as well, one thing is just, just uh, fence a node, and you, um, you, basically, so you basically kill one node, you start configuring your template for Kubernetes with all of your application, you declare everything as a cloud controller, you do the necessary bits. Maybe you just reinstall everything, so you have a, some kind of a containerized ready OS, like ORS or Atomic, for example, where everything is uh, already there for you, like the kubelet and uh, all the Kubernetes processes. So once you did that, you can simply start uh, bootstrapping your first containerized node, and then you continue, you keep on doing this, uh, you shut down the other node, you had, num well, just replica two, if it's a controller, for example, and then uh, Kubernetes will do the rest for you. So these are um, potential and like really general, of course, and we're just like scratching the surface here. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, we're gonna have issues with virtual machines, for example. Um, how should I be migrating my, my workload for this? Uh, one of the options for this could be Either you just say, okay, I'm so cloud native, I'm so cloud ready that I can kill any, any of my hypervisors, uh, but that's not gonna be the case, of course. So one of the options could be just live migrate uh, or just uh, do a, um, an evacuation of the hypervisor. Um, so yeah, that's uh, just like a brain dump. <laughs> All right, um, so from that, now I'm gonna be just describing um, some architectural example with, uh, with containers. So hopefully this is uh, clear for everyone. Uh, yes, it is, I guess. So this is more or less what the deployment, what the ideal deployment with Kubernetes will look like. Uh, so at the very top, you have your Kubernetes masters responsible. Well, it's just the brain of Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes core with etcd uh, and all the, the um, the Kubernetes process is responsible for replicating, for, uh, for just checking, uh, for scheduling, providing the API and so forth. What's really important to note is that uh, red, red boxes are uh, OpenStack components, blue boxes are uh, Kubernetes components, and yeah, green boxes are uh, Ceph-related components. Then the only thing that is really changing here is uh, if you look at the OpenStack controllers, I guess, no pointers. If you look at the OpenStack controllers, we have the Docker engine because by default Kubernetes relies on, on Docker, but at some point we're gonna add like more runtimes like RunC or um, just system DNS spawn or any or rocket or anything else. But now let's assume that we keep on using uh, Docker. So we, you have Docker, you have Kubelet, it's like the minion from Kubernetes just responsible for interacting with the, just the entity running the pods. Uh, listening on the pods, doing the self-healing uh, of the pods, just monitoring all the pods. And we bring Curie and Fuxi because we want to really bring all the features and expose all the OpenStack uh, features to this container world. And then all the boxes at the top, like APIs, databases, queues, LBs, uh, would be, oh, actually SB, LB is wrong because, um, yeah, one mistake. We're, gonna do, we're not gonna use LBs here because we have load balancers from Kubernetes, so. Yeah, I'll make sure I update the slides for uh, when we'll be sharing them. Otherwise, uh, other than that, all the components are being containerized, so all the APIs, everything. Uh, same goes for, for Ceph. We, are sti we'll sti we still need like Courier because uh, we, wanna, we wanna expose and connect the Ceph containers uh, to this OpenStack environment. We wanna have two interfaces, one for public communications and one for replication. So always these, uh, Object storage demons are just running in containers as well. OpenStack compute node, uh, all the OpenStack related components like such as Livert, uh, Nova Compute, Neutron, Open Research are running within containers. Um, it's more like privileged, privileged containers because uh, VMs are also running into containers. And um, yeah, that's more or less the, the, the general picture of, um, of the containerized OpenStack cloud deployment. Uh, now, the, um, this one is more like an announced version of something that we used to do already. It's uh, the hyperconvergence, where you collocate uh, 
compute and storage resources on the same node. So basically your hypervisors now will become hypervisors and storage. So they will be providing resources, CPU memory, plus uh, storage as well. One of the nice, thing, nice things here is that we get proper resources isolation. So we're not gonna have any naughty neighbor effect. Everything is really restrained to its own, well, C group namespace within the container. So the, every resources that are being allocated with, from a container, um, these are just the resources available. So it's more, this one is more an announced version because we used to already do this co-location, but now that we have containers, it's, it's easier to deploy and it's, of course, easier to do upgrades on the side. So you don't need, you can upgrade yourself cluster without doing anything from your, to your OpenStack environment, for example. So what's next? So just to give you a little bit of the container roadmap for, for, for Ceph, uh, because Cola is a, well, it's a project on its own. It's, it's moving quite well. Um, I think they just discussed that uh, because Cola has, uh, is really opinionated on the way they do the deployment. So as far as I remember, they started with Kubernetes and then they abandoned it. Um, then they moved, they tried using Swarm, they tried to use Mesos, and finally they came with something that works, which is well, Ansible. But now they're, I think they're discussing uh, bringing um, uh, Cola to, this, to its own project. So Cola is just going to be Cola and providing images to containerize all the OpenStack components. And then they want to have Cola Ansible, just the deployment piece with Ansible. They already have Cola Kubernetes providing all the templates to deploy and containerize OpenStack platform with Kubernetes. So it, that, there is not much to say for, for that. Uh, however, for Ceph, we, um, we have uh, plenty of things to do at the moment. Uh, as explained already, it's really working well now. It's really robust um, from a pure um, containerized uh, perspective. Uh, but what we want to really focus on in the next few months is like strengthening and doing a lot of QA on the Kubernetes prototype that we currently have, like running it, running it for several months, experiencing failure and see what's wrong and um, how, how to fix this. We, re we really also want to really improve the way we do CI because uh, it's, uh, if you're bringing new code and you just don't, if, you, if you don't bring CI, then it's not going to work uh, really well. So we really want to improve our CI testing and our, well, basically framework of, of test. We currently are running some uh, privileged containers with Ceph, basically because we need, we need direct access to um, block devices. This is something that we, that we can easily change, it requires a little bit of work, but this is um, something that, that should be done in the next few months. All right, so takeaways. Ansible plus Cola are both like really good candidates to start like smoothly when if you want to go with containers um, and start deploying a containerized environment for OpenStack and Ceph. Uh, support for Ceph is here and needless, needless to say that if you look at all the previous uh, surveys from the OpenStack Foundation, Ceph keeps on growing uh, in terms of adoption. So every, I think they're running it every six months and every six months, we're getting more percentage, more traction, and more usage um, from, POC, from POCs to uh, dev environment to production. Uh, Ceph is really the de facto, uh, well, has become really the de facto storage backend when it comes to backing up all the OpenStack components. So this is why we uh, are heavily investing in containerizing Ceph as well, because we are taking the assumption that if you're deploying OpenStack clouds, then you're also deploying Ceph. And then if, every, if, if OpenStack is already containerized, then Ceph has to be containerized as well. Um, as mentioned several times, Kubernetes is the right solution when it comes to containerizing everything and managing your container platform. It's just not really yet ready yet, but I mean, Google is investing a lot. Um, as far as I remember, Red Hat is one of the best contributors as well to this project. So we have been heavily investing into contributing to Kubernetes. So uh, this is happening and this will happen like in, in years. Um, and we are really investing into uh, fixing this uh, networking issue that I already mentioned, this uh, proper networking isolation. If you're interested in learning more on all the subjects we already discussed, if you're interested into Ceph Docker, Ceph Ansible, uh, Cola, uh, Cola Kubernetes and other things, we have, uh, we, have we just gathered uh, several um, links and several resources that you can uh, 
you can access uh, videos available as well to deploy Ceph, uh, a containerized Ceph uh, with Kubernetes and uh, with Ansible, for example. Uh, with that, I'm not sure how much time we have less, le left, uh, but we would all like to thank you for your kind attention, and I think we'll be really happy to, to take questions now. And as you can see, oh, we have yeah. Yeah, no need to take pictures for every single slide. <laughs> we should have told you that from the, from the beginning, I guess. Uh, all right, uh, any questions? All right, I guess we nailed it then. Okay. <laughs> and we'll be available here yeah. if you want to see us one on one. Thank you very much. Thank folks. you. Thank you.